Good. Um, all right. So I'm really excited. Uh, two really great friends and colleagues here uh, to present to you today. Tim Kachuriak. Uh, Tim is uh, Chief Innovation and Optimization Officer of Next After, uh, a Pittsburgh native. Uh, you can actually tell Next After's colors. Not sure if you ever noticed are gold and black, the same colors as the Pittsburgh Penguins, Pirates, and Steelers. That's not an accident. Uh, Brad Davies, uh, actually the newest member of Next After's team. Um, for a long time, Brad was uh, one of our enemies. I'll let Tim tell that story, but he's actually become a friend, a trusted ally, and colleague. Uh, Brad's from Nebraska, and he's kind of bummed about uh, Nebraska not being ranked in the preseason top 25 for the first time in like 40 years, so don't bring that up if you ever run into him. Uh, anyways, without further ado, I'll uh, turn it over to Tim, who's going to start this conversation through the online fundraising scorecard. <laughs> well, thank you, Jeff, for the uh, very warm and whimsical um, introduction. So I want to start by just sharing a little bit of a story because you know, there, there's always a story behind the story when you, uh, when you do a study like this. So the online fundraising scorecard, i got to first tell the story about the conference that changed my life. So about seven years ago, I attended my very first Mech Labs Optimization Summit. And uh, if you're not familiar with the organization Mech Labs, I know I talk about them all the time. Um, there's, there's, there seems to be a pretty interesting guy by the name of Dr. Flint McLaughlin, and he kind of, he, he, he's a very engaging speaker, he's a very powerful um, communicator, and I went to this conference and I'm listening to him talk about all the rigorous scientific methodologies that they take and they apply to optimizing the online sales process. And you know, through the course of their research, they, they, they've done tremendous amounts of research and they've codified the exact variables that exist in marketing that lead to more people saying yes in a sales funnel. And I remember thinking that was pretty cool. So I'm sitting there at this email optimization conference and I'm listening to Dr. Clint McLaughlin and he's walking through this email optimization heuristic. Email marketing effectiveness equals relevance times offer plus incentive minus friction minus anxiety. He's explaining how inside of this formula, there are both value factors and there's also cost factors. The value factors are relevance, offer incentive, and then the, the cost factors are these inhibitors, these bad things, these nasty things called friction and anxiety that either slows people down or stops them dead in their tracks. And I remember soaking all this in and I remember thinking, this is cool stuff, right? This kind of spoke and awoken the inner geek inside of me. And I was like, man, this is really, really cool stuff. And uh, I'm, I'm like one of these guys that when I, whenever I get like a new toy or something, right, I, I, I'm ripping it out of the package before I even get out of the store, and I can't wait to play with it. So the very first break we had at the conference, I remember calling my team. I said, guys, get ready because we're going to change the way we do everything starting on Monday. And I said, you know what? Let's not wait till Monday. Why don't we start right now? And at the time, we were working with the George W. Bush Presidential Center here in Dallas, and we were – renting email lists. We're doing email prospecting to acquire new donors. We're renting tons of email lists, and we're sending out these email appeals for the purpose of acquiring new donors for the center. And I remember, you know, talking to my team. I said, guys, give me like 15 minutes. I'm going I'm to, you know, play with this, this new formula that I'm learning, and I'm going to see if I can come up with a new treatment that we can test versus our longstanding control email and see if this stuff actually works. You know, let's see if it's even worth our time. So I remember staring at this formula, and I'm staring at this email, and I'm trying to figure out what should I change to not break the email, but at the same time, you know, it's got to be something that at least is enough of a change that will lead to uh, a difference. And uh, end up making only one tiny change. I don't know if you can, you can spot it here. And we'll go through this, this case study in a little bit more uh, detail later. But the very last sentence of the email is the only difference between version A, the control, and version B, the treatment. And if you read, you know, most, most best practice guides, they say, you know, only 18% of people read to the end of an email. So how can making one tiny little change to the very end of an email make that big of a difference? Nevertheless, we did our A-B split test. 100,000 people got version A, 100,000 random people got version B. And the difference was 159% increase in split through, which translated to a 42% increase in revenue. At that moment, at that moment, before I had ever even left the conference, I was absolutely hooked. I remember thinking to myself, I'm going to spend the rest of my life optimizing things. And I continued to do more and more of this exploration and, and optimization and experiments. 
And I kept going deeper and deeper into the minutia, and I was studying more and more and going more and more of these conferences. And it was at one of these conferences that the most unlikely of friendships began. Totally. So I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to, this is where I'm going to introduce to you, well, he's, he's my former nemesis, okay? I should, I should update this slide. So, so meet my former nemesis, Brad Davies. And at the time, Brad and I were direct competitors. We worked for uh, two uh, competing agencies, right? Yeah. So, you know, we were working with the same, same, same groups. Same and, uh, and, and, and I started seeing him show up at these things, too. And, you know, we started to find out that we had a lot in common. And Brad is now part of our team here at Next After, and we have uh, you know, been friends for many years now. But, you know, it was interesting. We, we had kind of like one of these once in a cocktail, so once upon a cocktail napkin moment. Just like, right? like the movie's drawn up in the lobby. Yeah, just after the out, conference, yep. you know, kind of brainstorming afterwards, maybe having a, a, a libation after a long day of, of, of research. And uh, we had this idea, didn't we, Brad? We did. We had this idea. We said, we need to do, we need to find a way to provoke a conversation about optimization in the nonprofit space. Because besides Brad and myself, I mean, nobody else was really talking about this stuff. So we decided to do our own study, right? Yes. And we said, let's, let's, let's do this. Let's go and figure out who are the largest and, you know, the top nonprofit organizations. And we came up with a list of 150 and somehow it's, it crept up to 100. Yeah, well, we had one there. Yeah, we had one, one <laughs> bonus organization showed up. So we went to 151 nonprofit organizations, 100 of which were in the Chronicle for Philanthropy, the largest nonprofit organizations in the world. We said, let's go to each of their websites and let's sign up to receive emails. And let's score the email sign up process. And then let's see what happens. Let's see if they send us email. We watch their inbox, and every single email that came in, what did we do, Brad? We, we, we time date stamped it. Yeah, right? Put all that information, and then if they asked to give a gift, we went off to give a gift and looked at that process. What was that like? And, you know, some people didn't send us emails, and so then we just gave gifts anyways. But, yeah, we scored the entire online fundraising process for all these organizations. And we were waiting. We were waiting for an opportunity to give a gift, right? We were waiting for them to send us an, an invitation to get involved financially in their cost. And if they asked us to give a gift, we clicked on the link, we went to their website, we went through their online donation process, and we gave a $20 gift. And we scored the online donation process too. And then we continued to monitor how they would steward our relationship through the email channel uh, and even in offline channels as well, yep. right? Well, after the process. process. Yep. And so really what we were focusing in on is these four key aspects that we have found to be critically important for an organization to raise more money online. Number one, you have to be growing your email list. It has been validated over and over and over again that the size and quality of an organization's email file is one of the, the number one predictive indicator of an organization's ability to raise money online, right? So you need to be growing your email list. You need to optimize your email capture process. And then the email communication process. How effectively do you use the email channel to inspire people to give financially to your cause? And when you give people an opportunity to give, how easy is it to give? How strong is that value proposition that you convey on the donation experience, right? And then finally, what happens after the gift, right? So we looked at these four key areas, email capture, email communication, donation, donation page optimization, and then the gift acknowledgement. And we had a 46-point assessment. We based the whole thing on MechLab's email optimization index, right? We, we based it all on this uh, optimization heuristic, and we yeah. learned some interesting stuff, right, didn't we? Oh, we learned a ton. It was a great study because of that and the data we collected. So what we're going to do now is kind of walk you through some of those findings, at least highlight some of the key findings there, and then kind of give you some next steps that you can absolutely take uh, even tomorrow to start to optimize your online process. The first thing we found was that the test was probably too hard. We found that most organizations would not receive a, a past grade on this, and so we probably set the bar a little too high compared to where the industry was. And so most groups were falling kind of if we do that bell curve there in that 70th percentile. Uh, so it just indicated to us, you know, there's room for improvement here. We can help uh, guide people or use this information to show them kind of what's the way forward, what we need to do to improve results, raise more money so that organizations can go out and accomplish their mission. So that was the first thing. Then we kind of split them out and said, well, maybe there's different sectors or verticals within the nonprofit sector that do this better than not, and that's what we found. We found on the kind of the head of the class around animal welfare and political candidates were scoring way outscoring some of the other ones on the low end. And the bottom five were Jewish organizations, Christian ministries, performing arts, hospitals, associations, and memberships. So there's a, a, a decent divide. 
in the different sectors of, of philanthropy, of these types of organizations. Some of it's more competition, some of it's just uh, probably less uh, resource hungry, but whatever it was, it seemed to be some distinctions between the two different kind of groups. And so we just, that's interesting. You know, I don't know what we do with that, but it's very interesting to see that some people are much more aggressive or thinking much more critically around online fundraising than others according to their industry. So let's get into it then. So like Tim already said, we believe that growing your email list is the most important thing you can do to increase kind of what you're raising online. And so we uh, first looked at when people, when you hit their website, how, does, how long does it take us to find the email capture? What does that process look like? And, and the good thing was in 76% of the cases, it took less than 10 seconds. Now, we were pretty generous. 10 seconds is a lifetime online. Eternity. But we weren't trying to make this too hard. We felt like, hey, listen, sometimes it's hard, but let's, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt. If it's on there, let's find it and let's count it. And that's what we found. So 76% of organizations, at least we could find the email sign up. Here's where it gets ugly, huh, Brad? But then we looked at, okay, what are you asking me to sign up for? Does it have any appeal to me as your ideal donor or constituent? And what we indicated was 66% had little to no appeal. And we'll walk through that here in a second. But really just what they were offering would not appeal to their ideal donor. And then on the other side of that would be the exclusivity. And we found that 84% did not have an exclusive offer. So that would be something that they can offer these uh, individuals that no one else can. Something that's kind of their content and their content alone. 84% have no kind of exclusivity in their email offer. So, now, Tim, now, uh, yeah, I mean, let's so, talk about this. Yeah, okay. okay. So, so this is probably the most subjective area of the study, okay? okay. And so what we want to do, let's walk through a couple examples. And I would like for you guys to score them along with us so that you can get a sense for really, you know, this is a lot more objective than you might think, okay? So there's two key areas we looked at, as Brad mentioned, the desirability or the appeal of the email sign-up offer and the exclusivity of the email sign-up offer. And we scored it on this three-point scale from zero, one, to two. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to, uh, and this is, by the way, this is a tool that Mech Labs has developed to be able to score email sign-up offers. So the first thing we'll do is look at uh, an example, and we'll score the desirability of that offer on a three-point scale. Is this offer um, associated with the email capture, is it something that represents no interest to the potential target audience, possible interest, or high interest? And then we'll do the same thing with exclusivity. Is this something I can find anywhere else on the Internet, which means very low exclusivity? Is this something I find maybe somewhere else? You know, moderate exclusivity, or is it something I find nowhere else, which is very high exclusivity? What you're looking for is high desirability and high exclusivity, okay? So we take those numbers, we multiply them, times each other, and if the score, score yep. Yep, is less than two, you probably need to recraft re the offer. Okay, so let's look at the first example here. We have blurred out the identity of the organization to protect the innocent, uh, but let me go ahead and zoom in here on the uh, email sign up offer, okay? Let's just look at the email sign-up offer itself, okay? Subscribe. We offer two newsletters and to your email and join. That is all that they're communicating to me about what I am basically, you know, signing my name to to be able to receive, right? Subscribe. We have two newsletters and your email and join, okay? So let's go ahead and score the desirability of that offer. Is this something that represents no interest, possible interest, or high interest? So go ahead and take a minute and score that, okay? Zero, one, or two. We were pretty generous, I think, Brad, and we gave it a possible interest. Maybe, you know, even though they don't tell us a whole heck of a lot about what I'm going to get, you're on their website. Yeah, so let's you know, you care about what you're doing, doing give me yeah. a way to engage, so maybe there's some interest. All right, okay. So now let's score the exclusivity. Based on what they're communicating to me, is this something I can get anywhere else, somewhere else, or nowhere else? Okay? Zero, one, or two, folks. Now, again, let's be generous. Let's, let's say, you know, even though by nature the fact that they point out we offer two newsletters, but they don't distinguish between the two, they're actually diluting their own offer, aren't they, Brad? They're, they're actually adding competing with themselves. They're competing with themselves, yeah. so they're, they're reducing the exclusivity uh, by, by simply stating that there's two and not differentiating between the two. But let's go ahead and be generous. We'll give them a one, okay? So we, we take one times one, and that's one, right? And so that suggests that we make that easy. Yeah, I mean, even if we gave two to one of those, it's still, you know, there's probably, you know, that's probably being generous, but there's probably some opportunity to optimize that, right? So let's look at another example. As I always find it's helpful to look at, a, you know, a real-life example, yeah. a show kind of what, what the, the, what the look 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 like, like in, you know, Rookie Meets the Road. 
Uh, right here in the center is the email sign-up opportunity. It says become an insider. Get instant free access to past episodes and extended teaching when you become a cross-examined insider. And then you click on the sign-up today, and it's got a clip-through. And it says when you become a C insider, you will receive special behind-the-scenes footage, including the making of, extended teaching and interviews from, an insider sneak peek of the compelling special, a virtual backstage pass, uh, complete unlimited access to past episodes, a subscription to our content-packed weekly newsletter, and much, much more. Okay? So let's go back to our scoring criterion. So the ideal audience, something that represents no interest, possible interest, or high, high interest. What do you think, Brad? Uh, this would be high interest. I think so. I think Probably so. very high interest. Okay. And what about on the exclusivity side? Is that something you could find anywhere else? somewhere else or nowhere else. And the beauty of this is when you go through and list all the items in here, obviously it's very exclusive. No one else has all these kinds of resources. Insider sneak peek, a virtual backstage app, extended teaching, special behind the scenes. I mean, like, that's obviously things we can't get anywhere else, right? So we'll give that a two. Two times two is four. So this is a tool that you can now use to score your own email sign-up offer. And we'll talk more about that later. But go ahead, Brett. Tell us what else we've got for you. So moving from email capture, then we looked at email communication. So we'll talk through some of those things. And what we did is after we again, well, after we signed up for all these email um, lists, we then we asked ourselves a series of questions. We said, well, if I sign up to receive emails from you, what might I expect to receive in the first 30 days? You've given me a chance to give you my email address. I've given it to you. What are you going to send me now? But what we found is only 63% sent at least an email, one email within the first 30 days. So 37% of organizations, after they gave us a chance to sign up, then did not send anything in the first 30 days. Pretty interesting finding there. Next question we asked was, we've been talking about the welcome series. And this has been kind of a best practice in the nonprofit space or in the email kind of uh, world for multiple years, probably more than a decade. But how many people are doing this? This is a great way to kind of measure that and see how effective it was. And we looked for anything resembling a welcome series. But what we found is 88% did not have anything resembling a welcome series. And again, we were very generous. It looked like it was a series. It looked like they were walking us through how to get more involved in the organization or had a special offer for us. We counted it. And we didn't have to count much because we got hardly any only 16 groups actually had a new email subscriber welcome series. So it was a big miss. The third question we asked is, how long after subscribing do people start to ask for money? These are all nonprofit organizations. We think, you know what, they need to uh, generate funds to keep doing what they're doing. Surely they're going to ask for money. Well, how long does that take? Well, we found a range of options here. So what we looked at it was in the first 30 days, only 37% of organizations that we signed up for again had sent us any kind of an appeal or anything asking for money. We thought, interesting. Well, let's see what happens at the end of 60 days. At the end of 60 days, it only jumped up 5%. Now we've only had 42% that had sent us anything or resembling appeal within the last 60 days. We thought, well, let's, you know, maybe there's something special after 60. Let's see, at the end of 90 days, we still didn't even have. We had 44% of organizations. So 56% of organizations did not send us a new email subscriber, any kind of appeal within the first 90 days. So we then we wondered, well, they must never ask us. If they haven't asked us in a full quarter of the year, what does that look like going forward? It probably doesn't look much. So very interesting finding around what people are actually sending uh, their email subscribers when people do sign up. Then looking a little bit more at the specific communications, what we found was that 64% of organizations had a single call to action. So what we're looking for here was, was there one thing that was very specific and called out that they wanted us to do as the recipient? So 64%, so over half, but not everyone, was still at least sending us a single call to action, and that would be not asking us to sign up for the newsletter and volunteer and give a gift, but it was at least honed in around give a gift or whatever that single point of a single kind of emphasis was. So that's 64%. Then we flipped it over and said, well, you know, this is mobile, and you know, this is back. We're pulling this stat here from 2013, where we, you know, 61% of consumers are reading all their emails on the cell phone, and that's probably higher now. Right? I don't think anyone would argue that. So 54% of organizations, though, aren't sending emails with any kind of responsive design, any kind of mobile optimization. This is a complete mess. If people are reading your emails on their phone and it doesn't uh, work well on their phone, if you have to do a lot of pinching and zooming, if people are going to delete it just out, right, out, right out of the gate. And so most groups were not doing this when we looked at this, uh, which is very fascinating. It's a big miss for organizations. They're not making sure that their communications are easy to read 
for their donors. So that was email communication. Then we jumped over to the donation experience. And we said, okay, let's look at, you know, once we've, they've spent all this hard work getting us on a landing page, what are they going to do? So the first thing we looked at was how long does it take to get to the end of the donation form? What are, what's the number of pages or clicks that we're doing? So here's what it was. We had it, we made this graph and showed, okay, here's all the organization, and let's see what number of clicks did it take. So you see a lot of them fell in that two, three, four pages to get it done. Now we're not concerned about one page. We think that's great. Two pages, you know, 30% of the organizations at least had a two-page kind of checkout process or donation um, process. Where it becomes an issue, though, is when you're looking at three, four, five pages. That person has to be incredibly motivated to keep wanting to jump through those soups. You know, in many ways, donors expect kind of an Amazon model, right? We've got a, a one-click checkout. They've made it so easy to spend money. And these nonprofits, they aren't making it as easy, and so they're only going to get the most highly motivated people to finish the process. And so there's just a lot of friction in the giving process. And let's, um, we always joke about this, but, you know, friction, you know, from physics standpoint is resistance of one service over another. When it comes to a donor, though, it's anything that psychologically um, stops you from going through that donation process. And like we say, you know, friction is probably not told. It's probably best experience. And so, Tim, um, this was your example you found, but this is, go ahead and look through this. Yeah, so let's go ahead and pretend that we're coming to this website. This is a microsite, by the way, for a fundraising campaign. This is several years old, so this, this site's not in existence anymore, so it's a safe example. <clears throat> but the purpose of this page, of this microsite, is to get somebody to give a gift. So if I came here with an intention of giving a gift, where do I click? It may take a second or two to locate, but up there in the upper right-hand corner is a little donate button, right? and the navigation right where I would expect it to be. So I click on that, and then it takes me to this page. Now, all of a sudden, I'm a little confused. Uh, most IPATH studies have validated the fact that most people's eyes track towards the main area of content. So this main block of text is where most of us are going to go initially. The first link we encounter says where your donations go, which is helpful. But that's not what I want to do, is it? I want to donate. Uh, search for your student or group. What does that mean? Looking for your page, click here. To create a fundraising page, click here. Uh, you know, moving to the right. Share this page. Sign up now. Big button. Uh, ask your question. Okay. 1-800-7-FAMINE. How do I donate? Uh, or get more info on how to donate. Uh, uh, join us now on Facebook. No, well, so believe it or not, the, the, the way, the place you need to click in order to continue on to the giving experience is this little text link in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen that says discover more ways to help. Now, the problem is, is that people have limited patience online. I mean, Brad just mentioned how Amazon and many online retailers are really streamlining their checkout process and making it easier for people to complete the transaction because they have realized, um, based on doing experimentation and uh, decision science and optimization, that when you have multiple different conflicting calls to action or if you're using insider baseball or if you're, you're you know, making it too confusing for people to complete the transaction, the people bail and they get out of there. So let's just pretend that we're a very perseverant donor and we click back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. We eventually discovered more ways to help. We'll click on that. Now it takes me to this page. At least now I see a button that aligns with my intention. Donate now. I click that. And then it takes me to a completely different website. Now I have this moment of reorientation as a visitor to this website, and I say, okay, where am I at? What am I trying to do here? How do I do it? And, oh, yeah, $30. Donate now. And then it does something kind of strange. It puts it in a shopping cart, which I think is strange because I'm not trying to buy a child. I just want to sponsor one. So I guess, you know, I get to check out. Whatever. It check out, and then it's like, now you need to create an account. And I'm like, oh, man. I thought I was almost there, and I filled some information. I continue. I filled more information. I continue more information. I continue more information. I click nine, ten times. And this is the experience that the donor has. We absolutely beat the ever-living snot out of these people that want to do nothing more than give financial resources to our organization. Now, this is a problem. Um, this is a problem for multiple reasons, but let me just start with a very basic one. There is a difference between giving a gift online and ordering a product online, okay? They seem similar on the surface, but the psychology of getting a gift versus the psychology of ordering a product is be more different. When you order a product online, the transaction occurs first, and then the benefit comes 
seconds, right? You go through the process, you complete your transaction, and then your book comes in the mail from Amazon the next day. Amazing, right? The benefit comes second when you order a product. When you give a gift, oftentimes the benefit to the donor is an tangible feeling, right? It's something that they experience first. They've been blessed. They've been inspired. They've been compelled with an opportunity to make a difference in the world. And so that benefit that the donor experience occurs first and the transaction second. So depending on how strong that feeling is, it's going to depend is going to determine how long your conversion horizon is. So I've got this little model here, simple little diagram, where I've tried to map the cognitive psychology of a donor that goes online to give a gift. This blue line represents the status quo. This is where your potential donors live. This is where all of us live, frankly. In order to get a donor to give a gift, they have to go from, from the status quo to interest, to involvement, and ultimately to investment. They have to progress through these three different stages. But the problem is, they live down here in the status quo. So what do we need? We need an interrupter, something that stops and arrests their attention and moves them into this first phase of interest. That interest builds until it reaches the engagement point. The engagement point can be a click. It could be an open. It could be a like on Facebook. It's where you begin to become involved in the message. It's when you begin to invest mental energy in the cause, the issue, the product, the service, the, the, you know, the appeal, what have you. Uh, and that involvement builds until it reaches the moment of decision. This is where you present your ask, okay? This is where you make your ask or in your appeal. And the donor has two choices, right? They can say, no, I don't want to give. And they return back to the status quo. They abandon the process and it's game over for today. Or they say yes, right? And if they say yes, they reach what I call the emotional climax. This is where the intangible benefit is paid to the donor. This is where they experience that intangible benefit that comes from knowing that you're able to be part of making a difference in something in the world, right? Now, depending on how strong that feeling is, is going to determine how long your conversion horizon is because eventually friction in your transaction process will eventually return people back to the status quo and they will abandon the process, okay? So you can see as a, as, as a donor you know, goes through this process, it, there, there is a certain kind of key uh, steps. And, you know, and friction is, is, there's so many different types of friction, but one of the biggest areas of friction that's occurring today is the fact that we're not optimizing the donation experience for the small screen. Brad mentioned how email were not being optimized for the small screen. And if your email appeal is not optimized for the small screen, then chances are your online donation experience is not optimized for the small screen. Based on our study, 84% of organizations did not have a donation experience that is optimized for a mobile device. In order to give a gift, I had to do pinching and zooming and all kinds of you know, finger moves in order to be able to complete and engage with the form. That's a problem. The next thing we found is that the value proposition doesn't just rear its ugly head in the email capture process, but also in the online donation process. Uh, almost 50% of organizations did not present a strong value proposition on their donation form. And that's a problem because, like, you know, let me use the example of, of going fishing, okay? So let's say we go fishing and we, we throw our line out there and we hook into a big fish. And once we have that fish hooked, we don't set the pole on the beach and expect the fish to swim in of its own accord. No. What do we do? We keep our tip up, and we keep cranking, we keep cranking, we keep the pressure on, we keep turning and turning and turning. Same is true in your online donation process. Just because you have inspired them with your appeal does not mean that they're going to continue all the way through that process, especially when that friction, when that tension gets a little bit higher uh, as they begin to go and progress through that transaction process. So the value proposition is a big deal. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second as well. Um, also, a sense of urgency. 86% of the organizations, when we looked at their donation form, they did not answer the question, why should I give now? Why should I give today? What is special about your appeal that inspires me to take action today? So those were several things that we found to be incredibly insightful. And, uh, and I think that you know, you'll find them to be insightful as well. And Brad, we found some other things too when we looked at what happened after the donation, didn't we? Absolutely. And so this final section then was the gift acknowledgement. So after the process is done, what's it look like to thank a donor? Uh, as we were a donor 151 plus times, interesting enough, 63% of the groups we gave a gift to didn't offer any next step, right? So 
Jim, you got to spark on your nation and how like kind of the emotional high of the, the process is when you've given that gift. And so it's like, well, what a great time to then ask a person to go on and do something else, to engage them further, to sign up for an event or, you know, give a non-cash gift or whatever these things could be. But 62% of groups are not offering that next step uh, for donors. Other interesting thing uh, you might be thinking is, what about, non, uh, what about multi-channel communication? You know, we've given a gift online, but what kind of mail did we receive? Because we watched that as well. And so 61%, 61 organizations sent us mail. It's about 41% of the people in the study actually have their online and offline act uh, in kind of some sort of concert, and, you know, they were working together. And so we did get mail from those, that group. Interesting enough, though, is that we got 48 uh, people, different organizations, sent us mail that weren't in the study. And so what does this tell you? It tells you that list exchanges are alive and well and that most groups are using them. And so what we like to say is if you're not mailing your online donors, someone else will do it for you. They don't, they don't have any qualms about it. They will go ahead and make sure that they're getting e uh, their appeals in their mailbox uh, above yours. And so it's just as important as an organization that what you do online reflects what you do offline and vice versa that you are using every uh, method at your um, disposable um, to communicate what's going on and how a person can support the organization. So final report, what this all kind of rolls up and look like is that there's a ton of room for improvement, that no one sector, no one organization really has this thing wired, that there's a lot of things, a lot of incremental improvements that we can make that can have occur in online fundraising that's going to help raise the level and raise in more income organizations. So there's tons of room for improvement across all sectors, all organizations. And that's a good thing to know. And so now what we want to do is give you five things you can do tomorrow. So we've just said, hey, listen, watch out for these things. But here's five things you can do starting tomorrow or even with whatever the rest of your today looks like to start improving that online fundraising. So Tim, walk them through the first one here. Well, the first thing you can do is, is sign up to receive emails from your own organization. Maybe you haven't done that in quite some time. And when you go through the process of signing up, uh, to receive emails from your own organization, I'd like you to go through and score the appeal in the exclusivity of the offer associated with your email capture uh, form. Okay, and I'd, I'd like you to you know, use that same exact scoring mechanism. We're going to send out after today's broadcast. We'll send out a, a copy of the online fundraising scorecard. We've got it in there, the scoring device. So take some time and go through that process. Just look at it with fresh eyes. Right, the eyes of your potential donor, and score the appeal and exclusivity. What else can they do, Brad? Be great. The next thing would be when you're sending out email communication. So your next email communication that you have scheduled or it's about to go, go back, reread the copy, and make sure there's one single call to action, that you're not asking someone to do lots of things, but you've really honed in on what's the one thing we want them to do, and that's really spelled out well in the copy, in the call to action, and you strip away all those other things that are, that are not central to that and have a single call to action it's going to improve what you're doing or what you're seeing in your response around your email. And measure it, right, Brad? You can't measure, uh, you can't improve what you don't measure. So exactly. you've got to measure it. Okay, number three, uh, design your emails for mobile first. And what I mean by that is if you can create your emails to first work and look pretty on a small screen, then chances are they will be able to scale up uh, pretty effectively and work on the big screen. But with more and more people looking at their emails on a mobile device, you need to make sure that you have that nailed down. If, if you know, the font is very, very small, or if there's lots of pinching and zooming required, or vertical scrolling, or all kinds of or horizontal scrolling, even worse, right? That that's becomes a big, big problem. So uh, focus on optimizing your emails for the mobile, the smaller screen first, and uh, that will you know, fix a lot of your problems there. Absolutely. And then just like Tim had said, hey, listen, go out and sign up for your emails. We'd also say, hey, listen, go ahead and give a gift to your organization. You know, give a gift in your son's or daughter's name and go through the process. See what that's like. It's often, often very enlightening. So you'll see, like, I, don't, I can't believe we worded it like that. Or I didn't realize that there was that extra step there. Boy, that's not really a warm thank you. That's boilerplate. I wonder if we can improve that and just enhance the entire experience for a donor when they're giving online. So giving gifts will really open your eyes to what it's like to be a donor to your organization and then gives you some very tangible ways that you can fix it and make some adjustments.
you know, I just realized this. I, for, I forgot we didn't include it in this deck, but we'll send it out in the follow-up email. We have a friction self-assessment, don't we, Brad? So what we could do is we can send out uh, a link to that. So before you go on and give an online donation to yourself, download this uh, friction self-assessment, and you can answer the questions as you go through the donation process, and it will tell you how much friction you have in your process. And then finally, um, the last thing you might want to focus on is, you know, don't leave your donors hanging. Uh, on that confirmation screen, after you thank them for giving that wonderful online gift, think about what's one thing you could ask them to do next. Could they share uh, a story? Could they share your organization with a friend? Could they um, you know, make some sort of post on your behalf? I mean, can they sign up to become an advocate? Should they sign up to you know, receive some sort of other type of communication from you? Is there volunteer opportunities? Uh, it doesn't matter what it is, but don't leave them hanging. Give them one more thing that they can do. I mean, the, 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 the point when somebody actually just completes a donation is when they have literally bought into your cause, and that's a great opportunity to give them another step of, of something they can do. So uh, hopefully those are five tactical things. I also want to give you four um, experiments that you might want to think about running um, when it comes to trying to optimize your online fundraising program. The first one is, is related to the email sign-up opportunity. And this goes back to that value proposition question. Let me know why I should sign up. So I want to walk through an experiment from our research library, uh, experiment number 1621, how communicating value impacts email acquisition. So this is an experiment we ran with our research partner, Alliance Defending Freedom. The goal was to increase the number of emails captured and right there on the home page is an email sign-up opportunity. It says email sign-up, inform about important issues and cases that impact your religious liberty. Email, and there's a little button there. And we said, okay, that, that might be good, but, you know, that's not, it's not a bad. I mean, it's not a bad value proposition, but, you know, good is the enemy of great. And we need to figure out how we can potentially optimize that. So we made some observations, and we came back, and we created a treatment. And in the treatment, we added a call to action headline. Be the first to know. We added some elements of exclusivity into this email side of offer. And then we began to quantify the value proposition. You know, here's three reasons why you should sign up to receive this today. And we changed even the button text to communicate value. Sign me up as opposed to the little email icon. So you can see the two side by side. The controls on the left, the treatments on the right. And in our A-B split test, the treatment produced a 44.4% e increase in the number of emails inquired. And so what this points out is that when you convey a strong value proposition and on your email capture form, you can inspire more people to understand the reasons why they should sign up and get more people to sign up. Okay? So uh, test number two, so that's related to email sign up. Another thing you can test is the email call to action. So let's go back to that first experiment that I showed you uh, from way, way back when, when we were working with the, the George Bush Presidential Center. I told you we made one tiny change to that email, and it was to the very last sentence of the email, and that change made a big impact, 139% increase in click-through and a 42% increase in revenue. So let's go ahead and blow up the, uh, the two sentences and look at them. The original call to action in the email Read like this, please accept this invitation to stay with President and Mrs. Bush for having a tax deductible online contribution. Now, I mean, it's not a bad call to action. I mean, it's a typical ask we might make in an email. But let's look at the optimized version. Please accept this invitation to become a charter member of the George W. Bush Presidential Center. Interesting. What conveys a stronger value proposition? Uh, giving a tax deductible online gift now, online contribution now, or becoming a charter member of the George W. Bush Presidential Center. What we did with the optimized version, we helped the donor understand the intangible value to them of taking the next step. We don't even tell them that the next step in, requires giving a gift because that can happen on the landing page. All we needed to focus on here is getting the donor to be inspired uh, to click as opposed to um, to trying to sell the donation. And, it's, and it's, it's related to the next thing, which is, you know, in your email, focus on selling the click, not necessarily the donation. Now, this is not always a hard and fast rule. But if you think about the series of micro decisions people make before they make the macro decision to give a gift to you, um, oftentimes we conflate the, um, you know, the, the email, the goal of the email with the goal of the landing page. The goal of the email 
should be to an inspire a click or to sell a click, and the goal of the landing page should be to inspire a gift. So uh, let's look at this experiment. In version A, this is a first in a series of several end of year emails uh, for the Heritage Foundation. In the control version of the email, the call to action is to donate now. So it's, it's got the typical call to action, donate now, give your online contribution now, give your tax deductible gift here today. Okay. So when the donor clicks, they have the understanding that they're clicking to give a donation. Well, that's great. That means I'm probably going to get only the people that are motivated uh, to give a gift that are going to be clicking. But maybe, just maybe, if we can get more people to click, we can get more people to the next step of the process. We can communicate value on the landing page and maybe inspire some of those people that never would have clicked to actually give a gift as well. And so in the, in the treatment, in version B, the test, we focus not on trying to sell the donation, about selling the click. We had this beautiful video on the landing page. And instead of, uh, and it, by the way, it's the same landing page for both. So nothing was different except for these two emails. We said, oh, instead of trying to you know, convince people to, to give in the email, let's just try to convince them to watch the video that's on the landing page. And then that video naturally transitions into an ask and into copy that moves them into a call to action to give, and they can give right there on the page. And in our AV split test, version B, produced a 369% increase in click-through, which translated to 121% increase in revenue, which means that we were able to get 369% more people to go to the next step of the process, which translated into more people giving at the end of the day. Okay? So focus on selling the click, not necessarily the donation in your emails. And then finally on the donation page, give me a compelling reason, or reasons even better, as to why I should give to you. This is the essence of your value proposition. Why should I give to you rather than some other organization or someone else or, or not at all? I mean, that's the question that we have to anticipate and we have to answer on our, our landing pages. Okay, so let's look at this experiment, experiment number 111, how copy on a donation page affects the force of the value proposition. So the control. This is a, a research project we did for uh, Senator John Cornyn's re-election campaign. This is their main donation page, and uh, it's not a bad-looking page. It's pretty simple. You know, we've got a little giving array there, 25 up to 2,600 and other, and, you know, and that's pretty much it. Nice-looking picture of the senator leaning up against the fence in his cowboy boots, you know, perfect for Texas senator, right? But there's a problem there. This page makes a fundamental mistake. It, it, it assumes that the donor already understands, or the potential donor already understands the reasons why they should give by the time they arrive there. Now, as I mentioned, we have to think about our ideal donor. We have to answer this question. We have to anticipate this question, because this is the question that is posed in the mind of every single one of their donors. And oftentimes, people are not even consciously thinking this, but this is the, 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 the weighing that they're doing in their mind. If I'm your ideal donor, why should I give to you rather than some other organization or not at all? We need to anticipate that question. We need to use our donation page to answer it. Okay? So the treatment, you can see, we just made a few changes. We changed the call to action. Instead of uh, just make a donation, which is a command, we say stand with John Cornyn. It's a little bit better. It's not that much better, but it's, it's, it's better. And then we added copy on the landing page that makes a logical argument as to why you should give a gift to Senator Cornyn because he's an experienced leader and he's done all this good stuff. And we, we back up every single one of these value claims with evidentials that, that, that point back to um, facts that, that back up every single point we're making and, and make them in fact true. So you can see the control and the treatment side by side. They don't look radically different. We just used some of that dead space to put copy on the page that conveys the value proposition, the difference, 258% increase in donations, okay? And so the, the key takeaway here is that, they, again, that there's a danger in assuming that your potential donor firmly grasps their organization's value proposition. By simply adding copy that communicates a strong value proposition, we can increase conversion rate in our donation pages. So, Four experiments that you can do. Email sign up. Let me know why I should sign up. Uh, whoops. Uh, email call to action. Uh, how do you communicate more value in the email copy itself that inspires more people to click? In the email content, 
focus on this principle of selling the click, not the donation, then finally on the donation page, give me reasons why I should give to you rather than someone else or not at all. So if you can't tell, Brad and I are pretty obsessed with this stuff, and, uh, and for good reason. You know? um, Brad and I, we, we, we often go back and visit this quote. Remember this quote we saw from uh, Nick Kristoff? He's, he's a writer for the New York Times. And uh, it actually irritates me every time I read it, but I, I think it's good. It's a good irritation. He said that toothpaste is peddled with far more sophistication than all of the world's life-saving causes. And, you know, personally, I think that's an abomination, right? We are, those of us who work in the nonprofit space, we're doing good stuff, right? We're doing things that make the world a better place, right? And so we need to get more and more sophisticated in how we approach our craft of fundraising, right? We need to get into the minutia, into the rigorous scientific methodology so we can, you know, even take from the, the for-profit space and adapt it to our, our nonprofit space, right? And we need to get, like, we need to, t like, embrace this heart of an optimizer that says what, right? It says that, 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 oh, yeah. that adequacy is the enemy of excellence. Yeah. We just don't want to be satisfied. We want to pursue greatness and excellence, and that means lots of changes. It means learning. It means testing. It means measuring and just striving for better. Because better, in this case, is not just more dollars, but typically more impact. And that's more ch children that are fed, it's more shoes that are provided, it's more clean water that gets distributed. That's what more means. It's not cash, it's impact. And that's what we want to see. We want to see more organizations have bigger and bigger impact around this. Uh, around this. And that usually means more resources. And so uh, we think it's a big deal to improve it. So with that, um, again, if you want to get the full scorecard, it's available here at nextchapter.com backslash scorecard. We'll send a link as well in the kind of the follow-up email with the recording of this. But sometimes if you don't want to wait, you can do that. And then finally, what, uh, the last piece here is we've developed a new email offering. And it's, uh, you know, we realize we have a lot of experiments. We have a lot of content there. We thought, you know, let's make this simpler. Let's send out a test a week. And so we, if you sign up for this versus that, you'll get an, one email a week. And it's going to look at two different, one of our most recent tests, and it's going to give you a chance. And say, okay, what do I think? Do I think the treatment A or treatment B is going to be a better way to, to accomplish the goal or to get a click or to uh, have, have the form look in such a way? And there you go. And you can click on it and learn as we're learning. And it's a great way to just bolster your marketing intelligence and what you're learning when it comes to testing. Um, it's just, we think it's a great offer, and we'd encourage you to sign up for it. So it's nextchapter.com backslash this versus that. Do that. Uh, and it's fun too, isn't it, Brad? It's, it's really fun. It's actually really, really, really fun. So um, yeah, we, we encourage you to go check that out. This versus that. It's a fun way to do that. So we are, I think, just about out of time here today. And um, um, want to see if we're doing some time for a couple questions, Brad. Want to see if sure. Up there and look at a couple questions. 